The Lacanian Subject by Bruce Fink. This is chapter six, Metaphor and the Precipitation of Subjectivity. The three moments constitutive of subjectivity described in the last chapter can be schematized as three substitutions or substitutional metaphors. In alienation, the other dominates or takes the place of the subject. In separation, object A as the other's desire comes to the fore and takes precedence over or subjugates the subject. And in the traversing of fantasy, the subject subjectifies the cause of his or her existence, the, other, the other's desire, object A, and is characterized by a kind of pure desiring without an object, desirousness. Stated in this way, we can see these three fundamental moments of the constitution of the subject as three moments of metaphorization. The cancelling out of one thing by another in Lacan's substitutional metaphors is at the root of Lacanian metapsychology. The subject here can be understood as resulting from a metaphor or series of metaphors. But metaphor is generally understood as giving rise to new meaning, in other words, to a new signification, not to a new or radically different subject. One of my principal theses in this book is that the psychoanalytic subject essentially has two phases, the subject as precipitate and the subject as breach. In the first case, the subject is but a sedimentation of meanings, determined by the substitution of one signifier for another, or the retroactive effect of one signifier upon another, or of one symbolized event upon another, corresponding to Lacan's definition of the subject as that which one signifier represents to another signifier. In the second, the subject is that which creates a breach in the real as it establishes a link between two signifiers, the subject, as precipitation this time, not as precipitate, being nothing but that very breach. There is thus one face of the subject that is almost exclusively a signified or signification. The subject of castration, a subject alienated in, taking up into, absorbed by meaning, dead meaning. And another that constitutes a breach between two signifiers as a spark flying from one signifier to another, creating a connection between them. This twofold notion of the subject is nicely embodied in the expression precipitation of subjectivity, found in as nearly at sorry, found in as early a work as logical time and the assertion of anticipated certainty from nineteen forty six, where we find the subject as both precipitate and headlong movement. As headlong movement or precipitation, the subject surges forth between two signifiers, just as metaphor's creative spark flashes between two signifiers in the process of metaphorization. In other words, metaphor's creative spark is the subject. Metaphor creates the subject. Every metaphorical effect is then an effect of subjectivity and vice versa. There is no such thing as a metaphor without subjective participation, and there is no subjectification without metaphorization. As metaphor's creative spark, the subject has no permanence or persistence. It comes into being as a spark flashing between two signifiers. As the result of new meaning brought into the world, however, the subject, the split subject found under the bar in the first two metaphors shown above, remains fixated or subjugated, and acquires a kind of permanence as such. The subject's symptomatic fixation has a metaphorical structure, that of a nonsensical signifier standing in for or over against the subject. We can provisionally view symptoms as having such a substitutional structure, wherein the subject is meaning persists indefinitely in its subjugated state, unless a new metaphor is achieved. In that sense, analysis can be viewed in Lacan's theory as requiring that new metaphors be forged. For each new metaphor brings with it a precipitation of subjectivity, which can alter the subject's position. Given that the symptom itself is a metaphor, the creation of a new metaphor in the course of analysis brings about not the dissolution of all symptoms,
but rather the reconfiguration of the symptom, the creation of a new symptom, or a modified subjective position with respect to the symptom. The end of analysis can be viewed as the effectuation of the substitution shown in the third metaphor above, whereby the subject assumes the place of the other and of the other's desire, object A, no longer being subjugated thereby or fixated thereupon. The signified. You must not rack your brains to try and understand this by seeking to compare it with something similar that is already familiar to you. You must recognize it a fundamentally new fact. Or you must rec recognize in it a fundamentally new, new fact. That's from Freud, from his introductory lectures on psychoanalysis. A new metaphor brings new meaning into the world. It alters the subject as meaning. But what is meaning in the Lacanian scheme of things? What exactly is it that metaphor creates, that metaphor affects or modifies? What is the signified, if not what we commonly refer to as thoughts or ideas? And what are thoughts but specific combinations of signifiers, that is, signifiers strung together in a particular way? When you grasp the meaning of something someone says, what goes on other than a situating of the statement in the context of other statements, thoughts, terms? To understand means to locate or embed one configuration of signifiers within another. In most cases, it is as non-conscious a process as one could desire, requiring no action on the part of a subject. Things fall into place within the web of multifarious connections among thoughts already assimilated. According to Lacan, something makes sense when it fits into the pre-existing chain and may add something to the chain without fundamentally altering it or rocking the boat. Metaphor, on the other hand, brings about a new configuration of thoughts, establishing a new combination or permutation, a new order in the signifying chain, a shakedown of the old order. Connections between signifiers are definitively changed. That kind of modification cannot occur without implicating the subject. As I said above, it is precisely insofar as understanding involves nothing more than situating one configuration of signifiers within another that Lacan is so adamant about refusing to understand, about striving to defer understanding, because in the process of understanding, everything is brought back to the level of the status quo, to the level of what it already, what is already known. Lacan's writing itself overflows with extravagant, preposterous, and mixed metaphors, precisely to jolt one out of the easy reductionism inherent in the very process of understanding, as opposed to the considerable attention that has been devoted to the process by certain German thinkers in Lacan's framework. Ver um, Verstehen might as well be translated as to, to assimilate. Thus, the gist of Lacan's claim that meaning, meaning is what you imagine you have understood, is imaginary. By assimilating something, you have the sense of being someone. Or you imagine yourself as someone, an ego or self, who has accomplished a certain difficult task. You picture yourself as a thinker. True understanding, on the other hand, which could perhaps be rendered in French using the expression se cessier de quelque chose, the emphasis being on the reflexive, is actually a process which goes beyond the automatic functioning of the symbolic order and involves an incursion of the symbolic into the real. The signifier brings forth something new in the real or drains off more of the real into the symbolic. True understanding is, of course, a misnomer in that understanding is precisely short-circuited, unnecessary, irrelevant to the process. What is really implied is that something changes, and that is the point of Lacanian analysis as well. Something takes place at the border of the symbolic and the real, which has nothing to do with understanding, as it is commonly understood. Hence the irrelevance of the term insight in the analytic process, the analysis subjective frustration at not understanding what is going on, how the analytic process is supposed to work, but is really at the bottom of his or her neurosis, and so on in no way hinders the efficacy of psychoanalysis.
Freud occasionally remarks that the analysand who achieves the most in the course of his or her analysis often remembers little, if anything, of it, and has no understanding of what occurred in the process. Two Faces of the Psychoanalytic Subject The two faces of the psychoanalytic subject, precipitate of meanings and breach, correspond, in certain respects, to the split discussed in Chapter 4 between meaning and being. Here, however, the split is not between unconscious meaning and the false being of the ego, but rather between unconscious meaning and a kind of being in the breach, or as Lacan says at one point, a subject in the real. The subject is signified. The subject in the real is not the person talked about by the analysand as limited in his or her, or bi- his or her abilities and capable of deciding between different courses of action, subjected to the whims of the other, at the mercy of his or her friends, lovers, institutional setting, cultural, religious upbringing, and so on. That person is what we might call, to borrow a highly ambiguous concept from both Freud and Lacan, to be explained in detail in Chapter 8, the castrated subject. The concept of castration covers an enormous amount of ground in psychoanalysis and current usage, and I will use it here only in a very precise way as referring to the subject's alienation by and in the other and separation from the other. The castrated subject is a subject who has come to be within language. The inadequately or insufficiently castrated subject corresponds to a subject whose separation is not complete. In Lacan's terms from the early 1960s, a subject who mistakes the other's demands for the other's desire in fantasy, his or her fantasy corresponding to uh, all these symbols. I can't remember what they mean instead of a bunch of other symbols. That's on page 72. The subject who refuses to sacrifice his or her castration to the other's jouissance is the subject who has not undergone the further separation known as traversing fantasy. For castration must be sacrificed, given up, or surrendered if subjectification of the cause is to occur. The subject must be must renounce his or her more or less comfortable, complacently miserable position as subjected by the other, as castrated, in order to take the other's desire as cause upon him or herself. The traversing of fantasy thus involves a going beyond of castration and a utopian moment beyond neurosis. The castrated subject is thus a subject who has not subjectified the other's desire, and who remains plagued by, and yet obtains a secondary gain from his or her symptomatic submission to the other. That subject can be characterized by the first two metaphors presented at the beginning of this chapter, but not by the third. Symptoms can be understood as messages about the subject that are designed for the other, and until the subject can separate from that locus, destination, in which his or her message and being takes on meaning, he or she remains castrated. Castration in this Lacanian context clearly has nothing to do with biological organs or threats thereto. Such threats may nevertheless serve in specific contexts to separate a male child from his attachment to his mother as preferred object of pleasure, but seem incapable of bringing on the further separation required to surmount castration. A kind of being is achieved through the first kind of separation, that provided by fantasy. Nevertheless, Lacan once again generally speaks rather of the aphanis or feeding of the neurotic subject in his or her fantasy as the object cause steals the limelight. Object A comes to the fore and is cast in the leading role in fantasy, the subject being eclipsed or overshadowed thereby. Thus, the false being of the ego and the elusive being provided in fantasy are rejected, one after the other, but Lacan as lacking, neither can take the subject beyond neurosis. In both cases, the subject remains castrated, subjected to the other. Lacan nevertheless maintains the notion of a being beyond neurosis. The castrated, the castrated subject is the subject that is represented. The castrated subject is always presenting itself to the other, looking to win attention and recognition from the other, and the more it presents itself, the more inescapably castrated it becomes as it is is represented 
by and in the other. The castrated subject is the barred subject, the subject under the bar. It is a product of every attempt and intent to signify to the other. This subject is constituted by the message. Received by the subject in an inverted form from the other. To understand this barred subject, we need to examine more closely the process of the creation of meaning through the effect of one signifier, S2, on another, S1. Of signifiers, unary and binary. The inauguration of the subject through separation is related to Freud's notion of primal repression. According to Freud, the unconscious contains vorstel lung represent tanzin, literally representatives of the representation or idea, but usually rendered in English as ideational representatives. They are the psychical representatives of trieb, drives. In Freud's view, it is such representatives and not perceptions or effects which are repressed, but Freud never really precisely determines the status of those representatives. The unconscious, he writes, is constituted through a primal repression, a first phase of repression, which, which consists in the psychical ideational representative of the drive, being denied entrance into consciousness. With this, a fixation is established. The representative in question persists unaltered from then onwards, and the drive remains attached to it. Primal repression creates the nucleus of the unconscious, with which other representatives of representations establish connections that may eventually lead to their being drawn into the unconscious. Lacan proposes that we equate these representatives with signifiers, words standing in for drives, i.e. acting as the representatives of drives, at the ideational level, the level of representation or thought. Signifiers are what allow drives to be represented, presented to us as beings of language. Starting from this equation of vorstel lung representanzen with signifiers, repression is conceptualized by Lacan as leading to the creation of the unconscious on the basis of a coupled pair of signifiers. The unary signifier, which Lacan represents as S1, and the binary signifier, S2. The binary signifier is what is repressed in primal repression. The signifier to which all other signifiers represent a subject. The signifier of the other's desire, the name of the father, is the binary signifier that is primally repressed. This signifier is quite unique. It is the signifier to which all other signifiers represent a subject. Should this signifier be missing, none of the other signifiers represents anything at all. This idea is expounded very schematically in Subversion of the Subject and Dialectic of Desire, and I will try to lay it out here. As we saw in the preceding chapter, Lacan postulates a primordial signifier that either is there or is not. If it is not, we speak of foreclosure and thus of psychosis there being no possibility for the existence of a subject as such, that primordial signifier being the sine qua non of subjectivity. The name of the father is thus our rock of Gibraltar. Lacan says that it is a signifier, but it is quite clearly different from most, if not all others. If one, if one word in a language becomes antiqui antiquated or goes out of style, other related terms tend to take up the slack. In other words, their meanings broaden to include those of the word that has disappeared. The name of the father, on the contrary, is neither fungible nor pronounceable. In psychosis, the barrier between mother and child offered by that name is not erected in a solid enough fashion. The father figure does not succeed in limiting the child's access to the mother. The signifier is not able to neutralize the child's jouissance and that jouissance erupts into his or her life, overwhelming and invading him or her. Different forms of psychosis are related to the different ways in which jouissance breaks in on the patient. Jouissance invades the body in schizophrenia, and the locus of the other as such in paranoia. The name of the father does not hold its own in psychosis. Returning to the case of neurosis, we see that for the name of the father, all other signifiers represent a subject. 
every signifier used by a neurotic is in some way, shape, or form linked to the name of the father. And the neurotic is thus implicated to a greater or lesser degree in every word he or she pronounces or hears. Nothing is innocent. Even his or her so-called empty speech implies a subject position with respect to the other, and every term has somehow contributed to making that position what it is. One is continually led back to the case of psychosis in bringing out the essential workings of the signifier in neurosis. Call each of these other signifiers an S2, as Lacan often does. In the late 1960s and 1970s, S1 is assigned the role of the master signifier, the nonsensical signifier devoid of meaning, which is only brought into the movement of language. In other words, dialectus dialectized, a term I shall explain below, through the action of the various S2s. In accordance with Lacan's later usage, the name of the father thus seems to be correlated with S1, the master signifier. If S1 is not in place, every S2 is somehow unbound. The S2s have relations amongst themselves. They may be strung together in perfectly ordinary ways by a psychotic but they do not seem to affect him or her in any sense. They are somehow independent of him or her. Whereas a neurotic may, upon hearing an unusual term, say anti-disestablishmentarianism, be reminded of the first time he heard the word, who it was he learned it from, and so on. A psychotic may focus on its strictly phonetic or sonic aspect. He may see meaning in nothing, or find a purely personal meaning in virtually everything. Words are taken as things, as real objects. For a neurotic, every S2 is individually linked with S1. S1 is not the subject, nor is S2. A subject is that which one signifier represents to or for another. What is representation supposed to consist in here? S2 represents a subject to S1 in the sense that S2 retroactively gives meaning to S1, a meaning it did not have at the outset. This meaning, written S as a lowercase letter, when Lacan gives his version of the Saussurian sign, is replaced by the S with the strikeout and the fuller version of the signifier's retroactive effect. That is schematized in figure 6.3, which I am not going to explain to you because it's just not possible, um, but it's on page 76. The subject here is but a constellation or a conglomeration of meanings. If the subject consists in the whole set of meanings generated by the relation between all the S2s and S1, the subject seems to be a sort of sedimentation of meanings furnished by the other, the subject's statements only taking on meaning in the other or being granted meaning by the other. The subject as the meaning that settles out, in a sense, from the effect of one signifier upon another, corresponds to the subject as eclipsed by meaning, meaning always being in the field of the other. The subject as meaning, unconscious meaning or meaning in the other, can be situated on the schema of the split subject. In the lower right-hand corner, unconscious meaning is created, but the subject is deprived of being. The subject as breach. While there seems to be little, if anything, smacking of subjectivity in such an interpretation, the subject is nevertheless realized in forging links between S1 and S2. The subject is not simply the sedimentation of meanings, but also the forging of links between signifiers. Freud's term for the paths forged from neuron to neuron in his physiological sketch of the psyche in his project for a scientific psychology is banung, lamely rendered in the English translation as facilitation, which Lacan translates as frayage, a sort of breach or path-breaking he takes Freud's idea to be that of breaking through that establishes a link or articulation between so-called conceptual memories and readily associates these neuronal links with the links between, between signifiers. The subject is the path forged between signifiers.
In other words, the subject is, in a sense, what links them to one another. By the time Lacan elaborates the four discourses, S1 has become a positional notion. There is no single unique S1. S1 simply designates a signifier which is isolated from the rest of discourse. Or as Freud says in the interpretation of dreams, which is cut off from the psychical chain of the person's conscious thoughts. An S1 is often recognizable in analysis by the fact that the analysand repeatedly butts up against the term. It may be a term like death, for instance, or any other term that seems opaque to the analysand and that always seems to put an end to associations instead of opening things up. Here, the analysand is, in a sense, encountering a total opacity of meaning. He or she may well know what the words mean in his or her mother tongue, remaining ignorant, however, of what they mean to him or her, their special personal meaning that has some kind of subjective implication. The subject here is eclipsed by a master signifier without meaning. In that sense, the master signifier is nonsensical. The precipitation of subjectivity, dialectizing a master signifier. One of the goals of analysis is to dialectize such isolated terms, these words that put a stop to the flow of the patient's associations, that freeze the subject, or rather annihilate him or her. Dialectize here is the term Lacan uses to indicate that one tries to introduce an outside, in some sense, of this S1 that is, to establish an opposition between it and another signifier, S2. If we can bring this S1 into some kind of relationship with another signifier, then its status as a master signifier subjugating the subject changes. A bridge is built between it and another linguistic element, and a loss takes place. I won't go into the complexities of the loss. Object A here... Um, but see chapter 7 below. Plainly speaking, the analysand is no longer stuck at that particular point of his or her associations. After running up against the same term off and on for what may have been months on end, it begins to give. A meaning of that master signifier for the subject is created, and the subject is once again split between meaning and being. Having come to be momentarily in the forging of a link between S1 and S2, the creation of an opposition between an S1 and another signifying element is what allows for a subjective position. Note the opposition here between the subject who has come to be in the bridge building between S1 and S2, along the arrow, in a sense, and the barred or alienated subject of meaning, relegated to a site below the bar. Each isolated S1 is when it appears nonsensical. S1, unlike S bracket A bracket, it's not really an A, but it's like that A symbol, I don't know. It looks like a capital A. Is not unpronounceable. It is not some mysterious hidden signifier that finally wells up from the depths one day. It may very well be a word or name the analysand has used every day of his or her life. It insists, however, in the realm of non-meaning when it comes up in a context that seems to involve the analysand, though the analysand does not know how or why. Nonsense may, of course, take other forms as well, and may appear in an incomprehensible slurring of words to which no meaning whatever can be attributed, as the resulting sounds suggest nothing in the way of a play on words. Lacan's emphasis, in any case, on the importance of nonsense is related to the analytic aim of, dialecti of dialectizing the signifiers that, in the course of analytic treatment, come to the fore as isolated master signifiers. Autism might be seen as a case in which there is one or only a very few master signifiers that are virtually impossible to dialectize. In neurosis, there is generally a whole series of master signifiers that manifest themselves in the course of treatment and that catch our attention as being stopping points or dead ends of some kind. It is those dead ends that analysis sets out to make into, into through streets. The subject appears in the process of clearing an obstacle out of an impasse, 
thereby creating an outlet. The subject is, in a sense, the splitting of that obstacle into two separate parts, S1 and S2. I have, by this point in the discussion, provided at least four separate ways of understanding what psychoanalysis sets out to achieve. The dialectization of master signifiers, the precipitation of subjectivity, the creation of a new metaphor, and the subjectification or assumption of the cause. The reader who is by now familiar with Lacan's ever more polyvalent algebra is no doubt prepared to hear that they are all one and the same, that is, that they are all partial ways of characterizing the same basic aim. When a master signifier is dialectized, metaphorization occurs, the subject is precipitated, and the subject assumes a new position in relation to the cause. They all come under the process of separation, and of that further separation Lacan refers to as the traversing of fantasy. Separation is ultimately what analysis with neurotics is all about. Apart from all the symptoms neurotics present, whether psychosomatic or purely psychical, that stem from identification with parents, relatives, and so on, and that must obviously be worked through. A large part of the work with neurotics revolves around the completion of separation, whereas Freud suggests that analysis, when pursued far enough, always comes up against the insurmountable rock of castration. Lacan suggests that separation can take the subject beyond that point, Subjectifying one's fate, that foreign cause, the other's desire, that brought one into the world, alienation can be surpassed. A utopian moment of sorts in Lacan's work, this passage beyond castration was, to the best of my knowledge, never recanted in Lacan's later work, unlike other utopian moments, e.g. full speech, which were implicitly critiqued in common instances of Lacan against Lacan, the late Lacan against the early Lacan, Thus, it stands as a cornerstone of, Lacan, of Lacan's rebuttal to, or surpassing of, Freud.